Hi. Um, I, Pam is in Rome, right? R Rome in this week, so I, I will take the responsibility of thanking Suzanne Prince and her husband for sponsoring the six week series in memory of her father, Robert Floyd. And, uh, and I, I mean it, it's like it just, it's a very beautiful trip. Okay, so we're, we're at the end. Um, so this is, this is the last week, and as promised, we're going to get to Yaakov and, you know, going to finish up Yaakov and Esau, and then we're going to move into Yaakov and his wives and his children, which I think puts, what's it called? The sister wives, whatever puts that show just to shame. Um, it, it's, it's really, you know, I think that one of the reasons that the whole Yaakov, Yosef, wives, children story is, takes up so much space in Sefer Breshid, actually I think there are two reasons. Number one, it's an incredible story of what not to do in a family. But even more important, and I think this is one of the points that I try to make to my students, because when freshmen are coming in, it's, it's really rather disconcerting to them that these people that they put up on pedestals their whole lives not only have clay feet, but you know their entire bodies and psyches are rather frail. But what's so amazing to me is that that this whole group of 12 overcame their, and we're going to talk about that, overcame everything that went before and united, and to some degree stayed united, and the fact that Yehuda and Binyamin are the two Shvatim that have, you know, that more or less remained um, is, I don't think, coincidental in the least. So we're, we're going to, but we'll get there. Okay. So we're going to start with the, uh, the famous scene of the switching of the brachot. Um, so we are in the end of Chai Sarah. I believe it's called Kafhe. See? Yes. Okay, let's hold it. I'm sorry, my bad. It's the end of quiet. It's the end of total. I have my stickies. I'm just reading them. Okay. Um, okay, so we are in Karak Kaf Vav. Zion. Sorry, Kaf Zion. Chapter 27. Okay? So. If you look back, actually, the, the previous pasuk at the end of, of Kavvav, which I think is not, if you if you have a Tanakh that looks like this, or for that matter, if you have even a Chumash, you will notice that the very, very last two psukim of the Perik are set apart. They're set off, right? There's a, a there are spaces of nine letters. It's called the Stuma. These are, I always teach my students that um, we typically go by prakim and a parak, a chapter is the one part of the Tanakh that has nothing to do with Judaism. Okay, the, the, the prakim, the chapters, are a much, much later invention. Um, there's a big debate about whether the chapters were purposely divided by Christians in a way that it was different from the way Jews had divided it, or it was just a question of Christians by that point, had lost the way Jews divided it. There are certain points where you can really make a good argument that it served Christian theology to make a division where it was. For example, at the end of Perak Aleph of Sefer Bereshit, um, if the way the Perak is divided is the end of Perak Aleph is, um, is the end of the sixth day. And the beginning of Perak Bet is Shabbat. And this really serves a Christian purpose well in that the six days of creation are one and the Lord's Day is the focus of the next chapter. Right? So it begins by Hashemayim and the heavens and the earth were finished and the Lord and the Lord's Day it takes center stage. If you look at the way the the Parsha, when you lane it, is divided, Rishon goes all the way through Shabbat, right? Vayichulu is actually part of the first Aliyah. The second Aliyah begins with Ela Toldot Shemayim Behibar Am. The second Aliyah begins with, basically, with, with the story of, of man. 
So basically the God's creation of the world has its focus and then man and his doings has its focus. And, and that's I think one example where it's very intentional the way these chapters were divided to serve theological purposes. Our divisions, um, the earliest divisions that we have historically, are actually these Ptuchot and Stumot, places where the Masoretic text was broken up. They're basically our paragraphs and our, our chapter headings. And, and a Stuma, which are the breaks that you see here right before Parakov Zion, is a little break. It's, it's kind of what we would consider like a paragraph, whereas the, the breaks which go to the longer, to the end of the line, those are called to hold or open breaks, those are almost like chapters. And <coughs> um, it, in Sefer Breshid, it's really fascinating because you can sometimes go three, four prakim without any kind of a break. Um, whereas in others, like let's say in Sefer Dvarim, you can have, particularly once you get into the halachic pieces of it, you have parashia breaks every two, three psukim. And this whole concept of going well, lama nismecha parasha x2 parasha y is really not necessarily about what we consider a parsha, but rather a section. Okay, so our divisions, the oldest, are these two hokens to mode. The aliyot and, and the para, what we call parasha, actually came later because even in the time of the Mishnah, the Torah, the Tanakh, the five books of Moses, was actually read in a three-year cycle, which is something that the conservative movement adopted in different forms over the course of the last half century. Um, and then by the time of Yavne, basically, as Jews were becoming more and more dispersed, Chazal decided, okay, this is just, we don't have enough Jews together in one place for enough time to take three years to go through Hamisha Chum Torah. We need to condense it. And so we do it once a year, because then when you're being expelled and chased and hounded by Rome or France or Germany or Iraq or whoever, you, you don't necessarily know that from one year to the next you're going to be in the same place. So somewhere in the first centuries CE, we went to a one-year cycle of parashot, each parasha being divi divided into seven aliyot. So, believe it or not, what we have, you know, Breshit Noach Lech Lecha, is a quote-unquote recent, in, in the historical sense, a fairly recent evolution, whereas the smaller breaks goes, seems to go back much older, and we see them, like, even in the, in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Like, that's how we know how, they, how old they are. We know that they go back, certainly before the turn of the millennium. Okay, so that's just, um, so the, the immediate parashia, and I don't think it's, it's coincidental that it's, it's set off that way. Vayihi Esav ben Arba'im Shana, Vayikach Isha, okay, and so he was 40, and this shows his kibbut of, because when his father was 40, he married, so he's imitating his father. So when he was 40, he took a woman, et Yehuda, Yehudit bat be'erit, Hachiti, the et bosmat bat ilon hachiti. So he took these two Hittite women. And, and the Hittites at that point were considered the most um, technologically advanced of the Canaanite tribes. They had the most sophisticated weaponry, but as a result, they were also considered, certainly by Semitic standards, the most barbaric and really the most amoral. So here on the one hand, Asaph is attempting to be respectful of his father and to marry at the same age when his father got married. And on the other hand, his choice of women once again just indicated what his value system was, which was you know, technological advancement at the expense of moral integrity. And then in, in something that's pretty unusual, um, where we hear Alana Applebaum, Rachel Nordlich, please go to Mrs. Appel's office. Alana Applebaum, Rachel Nordlich, to Mrs. Appel. Okay, so what's, what's actually very unusual, and unusual in the sense that this is the only time this happens between the Avot and Imahot, is where the wife feels a certain way 
and the husband goes along with it, basically. Like, there's no disagreement, which is, is what's, again, and that's, I think, fairly typical of their relationship. So, Vatiena Marat Ruach Li Yitzchak, um, I'm sorry, it's the, it's the, all the Rivka, that, that it's, it's, there was, it was bitter for both of them. And then, and we know that actually it's Rivka who, even though Yitzchak is mentioned first, we know that from the end of, of the Parsha, the motivation that Rivka gives for sending Yitzchak, I'm sorry, Yaakov, to her brother, is she says, I'm like, I'm, I'm sick to death, like my life feels like it's been shortened because of these wives that Asaph has. I don't want Yaakov marrying any local women. In other words, even if we send Yaakov away from home to preserve his life, I don't want him staying in Canaan. I want him to go back to Haran so at least he will marry within the tribe. But in a sense, and Yaakov, Yitzchak goes along with it and gives Yaakov his bracha, but they, they agree here. And I think the fact that this is the little section, number one, that it's set off by itself, heightens its significance. And then the fact that this little section is juxtaposed to the next section by he Kiza Kane Yitzchak Vatika Hena the beginning of the whole story of the um, of the bracha incident, is I think it's important because we tend to look at the the incident of what Rifka did, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, as being odd, and that's an understatement, and completely out of any kind of a context. But when we look here, it's very much in a context. What she's saying is, is that these are, are these two boys have different value systems. And they had different value systems when they were born. They had different value systems when they were 15 years old. They're now both 40. Remember, if Esau is 40, Yaakov is 40. We tend to forget that they're twins, right? So if they're 40 years old, and Esau is still who Esau is. Okay. By the way, little known fact, and don't ask me to prove it mathematically because Rashi does and I can never, never remember it, but Rashi does. 25 years pass in between the time. This, the, the whole bracha thing happens when the boys are 65. So we, we, again, we think of them as these like strapping teenage lads, but they were not strapping teenage lads, they were middle-aged men. Um, and um, which is, is, looks a little different than, than the strapping teenage lads. But the flip side of it is, is we can't excuse Aesop anymore for his behavior by being a dumb teenager. Okay? If you have a 15-year-old who makes poor judgment calls, okay, that's acceptable. The fact that he's 40 years old, and we know that 40 is a very significant age, and it's considered the age of wisdom, and by the, this is when full maturity supposedly sets in, and there's lots of sources for that. And he's still making stupid decisions. That already is what kind of sets alarm bells ringing. Suzanne, you wanted to say um, something? Yeah, is there any significance that the, the, the Hiti wife is named Yehudit? It's a good question, um, and, and the answer is, is I've never found a good explanation for that. Um, you know, my, I don't know. It, it probably was some, it was a common name um, in that, that region. In other words, Yehuda's name is given for what it is, um, but I don't, I never really imagined that the Imahot just made names up completely out of context. This was, you know, probably within the sound. There are so many names that have similar, that, that yud and that hey sound in it, that those are probably common language sounds then. But it's a good question. I've researched it, and I haven't found an answer yet. Um, so, OK. So so let's, let's look at what happens. As I said, this is kind of a lesson in dynamics between parent and child, and as well as eventually between brothers. So Yitzchak the, tells us, right, Yitzchak's vision has become dim. And, and again, we know that that is a metaphor, whether it's literal, whether it's figurative, whether it's both. But you know, when he was old, Yitzchak was old, and his eyes became dim in the sense that his his vision, both his physical vision and his mental vision, was not so clear anymore. 
this judgment was even less clear, supposedly, then than, than it had been earlier. Right? And then he, Vayikra um, et Esa, he calls, and we know that the Lashon of Kriyaz is intimate and close, so he calls to Esa, his Hagadol, his greater son. The word, please note that the word Gadol here is written Chaser, and many of the um, grammarians like Ibn Ezra, like Balaturim, always discuss when a word is written chaser, it means that's a little hint to us that there's something missing. So the fact that gadol is written without a vav indicates there's something missing. And he says to him, Vayomer Elav, Bini, tells us right from the get-go how Yitzchak feels about this child. Right? We don't need to have the word Bini, especially because it just says two words before, right? Bino hagadol. But the Torah is saying, this is how Yitzchak feels. This is you know, my son, my child. Right? Bincha Yechidcha. It's back to the way Yitzchak himself was referred to. At Bincha, at Yechidcha, Asher Yitzchak. The first one is, is Bincha. Like that's primer. This is my son. Vayomer um, Elav. And and Vayomer. And Esau says, Hineni. Also very reminiscent of the Akedah. There's no doubt in my mind whatsoever, despite the Midrash that says that Esau you know, kind of spent his life trying to trick his father, um, there's no doubt in my mind that the one person that Esau truly, truly, truly loved was Yitzchak. That, that what, you know, that Yitzchak, that Esau, far from taking Yitzchak's love for granted, cherished it. And, and we're going to see in his response that'll be corroborated. We'll, we'll get there. Um, so, he, so Yitzchak says, "Vayomer, he knows Behold, I've become old." Kind of stating the obvious, but he's saying like, "Okay, it's relevant, right?" He yadati ki isham at When when you've got this like he and then something that seems he meaning not obvious, and then it states something that is obvious, what that's saying is, is that the obvious has become relevant, okay? Which it was, in a way that it wasn't before, and I don't know when I'm going to die, right? Go, we know the story, go and, and get me some food, um, and then bring it to me, and I'll eat it, so that my soul can bless you before I die. In other words, I need physical strength, in order to summon the spiritual strength to bless you, right? Because prophetic vision actually takes quite a bit of physical energy. So he's saying, like, I don't have that physical energy anymore to be able to give you a bracha. I, I, need, to, I need to be happy, basically. I need to be physically satisfied. I need to be happy. I need to feel whole. And then I can summon that strength. Okay, so Yitzhak, I'm sorry, Yitzhak goes off. He goes to the wilderness. Um, and uh, he goes goes to do his his stuff, right? And meanwhile, the Rivka Amra El Yitzchak El Yaakov saying, "Hine shamati et avicha midaber al Esav." I heard your father speaking to Esav, and, and she says, "Go deceive your father." Okay. Um, and and I want you to kind of take note. He said, "She's how many psukim she talks for?" Okay. She starts talking in Pasuk Vav, right? The Rivka Amra El Yaakov. She starts talking. She's talking in Pasuk Vav. She's talking in Pasuk Zion. She's talking in Pasuk Chet. She's talking in Pasuk Tet. She's talking in Pasuk Yud. She's talking through and including Pasuk Yud. She talks, for what we say, five Pasukim straight. Hmm. That's a lot of talking. And it's not until five psukim have passed, the Yomer Yaakov El Rivka, Imo, right? He's going to, my father's going to know the difference, and he's going to curse me, and I'm going to be like a, a, a literally a broom, a matate, like a doormat. I'm going to be a doormat, and he's going to curse me, and he's not going to bless me. And then his mother responds, Alai kalatcha b'ni, shma b'koli v'leich kachli. Okay, and then she basically, again, kind of summons the kol asher tomari layach sarak, shma b'koli. 
She does a lot of talking. He puts up one line of resistance. It's a pretty strong line. But again, let's not forget, this is a 65-year-old man talking to his, unclear how old, but at least, let's even assume, right, that Rivka really was three, we take the Midrash on its face, when she married Yitzhak, who was 40. So this is a 65-year-old man talking to his 88, minimum, 88-year-old mother. And she's talking, and she's talking, and she's talking, and you kind of can see him just standing there like that, and it puts up this momentary, um, you know, push. So what we see in the dynamic of both parent and child is the, the kibud horim that both children have for their primary parent. We know that Yaakov had the relationship with Rivka, Esav had the relationship with Yaakov, with, with Yitzchak, and one common thread in the way that these children were raised was with a tremendous sense of respect for their parents. And so that it shouldn't be so surprising that then when we get to the Aserat Hadibrot, that number one, Kaveda Tabi Chaveti Mecha, is there. Okay, it, 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 it's kind of an interesting, it's an interesting Dibra in that it's the one Dibra that actually isn't so self-evident, right? All of the other interpersonal ones are pretty self-evident. And then the ones about belief in God, if you're going to assume that this is a monotheistic religion, establishing that monotheism and that own monotheism is, is pretty self-evident. And that God is the creator of the world, and therefore when he rests, you should rest. But then, you know, number five is stuck in there, Kaveda Dabi Chaveti Mecha. Did you ever stop to think about why? Like, why do we need to have a society <clears throat> where respecting one's parents is a sine qua non to the extent that it is part of the, it is on the side of the deep road of Bin Adam Okay. Um, this you know, we see that this is definitely one of the core, core values in the earliest years of, of monotheism, right? Like you could say that, you know, Abraham raised Yitzchak for his, de to have the, Abraham has had his Ben Adam L'chavero, from which his Ben Adam L'makom followed, right? He trained his son in the Ben Adam L'chavero. I'm sorry, in the Bein Adam Makom, right? The Akeda. The Bein Adam Chavero suffered a little bit. Uh -huh. What Yitzhak and Rivka clearly did is they trained their kids, at least in the Bein Adam Chavero, with the sense of the parents. So again, in a, it, you know, this is very classic family systems theory that to some degree, you know, we try to make up for our own deficits by making sure that our children don't suffer the same fate, so to speak, as, as we had to deal with. Now, sometimes that's to our peril, but the thinking is logical, right? If you grew up one way and then as an adult you realize, okay, this really was not the best way for a child to grow up, let me try and do it a little bit differently. And so Yitzchak tries to do it a little bit differently by really focusing on the physical to the extent to the, to the exclusion of the spiritual. Rivka tries to focus on the spiritual to the exclusion of the physical, but one thing that they both have in common is, is that respect for parents is paramount. But so do you think this is, was an innovation of monotheism and of Abram, that you know, the tribal you know, uh, Canaanite tribes didn't have also that? I mean, when you think of tribal, you also think of like, you know, you res there's a, a respect for elders and there's a hierarchical elders. system. Right. I think my understanding, and I'm not an expert in ancient Middle Eastern or Near Eastern studies, but the way I've always understood it is that the respect was for the priests. Oh. It wasn't for your immediate, like this was something new, this idea that your family elder was the one who deserved the respect, rather than the representatives of the gods mm -hmm. on earth. But that was that was a, that was the innovation. And way you know, and the other thing is, is that way before we went back to a system of having there wasn't a priestly class originally intended. 
that was like another thing that was in a way a way to break away from ancient religions. Like originally, originally it was the Bahor of each family that was supposed to be the Kohen. It was only when that model proved insupportable that Hashem said, okay, plan B, we're going to take a specific group and a group within the group to be, and that plan didn't even work so well until God said, okay guys, this is my plan, this is the stick that bloomed, you just watched a whole bunch of those Levites get swallowed up by the earth, could you please stop now? And then they finally stopped, you know, but it took how many hundreds of years before that was established, right? Like if you think about the time from Abraham until the time of Moshe, we're talking somewhere around 400 years without a priestly cast. And it was actually only when they got back into Canaan, and only once Yeravim became king, which was yet another 500 years later, that this idea of the priestly caste superseding God again became put back into place. So we've got close to a thousand years of this idea that there's God, and there's man, and there's really not that much in between. And that's kind of the way it should be, should in, in quotes. And that the idea of having a group in between is, is a fallback rather than a, it's a bidiyevit rather than a lachakriya. Very different way of thinking about it. Yes? Um, I'm thinking about what you're saying and about what you've said in the past and also when you particularly drew our attention to the word bini, um, and and I, for sure, we know about this tenderness that he felt towards Esau, but I'm wondering whether we can also say Yitzchak is our emotions man, you know, and totally. he's one of the rare ones. The circumstances that all of them have been in could have elicited an emotional reaction, and we don't. They're, they're men of action, you know? Right. Uh, this is their strategy, this is what we're going to do. But Yitzchak, with all of his circumstances, since he's not a man of strategy and action, he seems to be more capable of focusing on the emotion. And as this particular narrative plays out, when he finds out what happens and he shakes and he's all upset and he's worried, you know, I wonder, maybe we are supposed to learn about emotions to some degree from Yitzchak. It's an interesting concept because the way I've always, for a long time, I've understood like that Bereshit is a cautionary tale to what happens when emotion trumps rational thought. Right? Abraham loves Ishmael, doesn't want to kick him out. Yitzchak loves um, Asa. Yaakov loves Rachel. When emotion, I think, I think what I'm seeing from what maybe what what okay, what I'm hearing what you're saying is is that Yitzchak embodies like the power of love, uber alles. Like he maybe he really does see what Yitzchak is. It's like it's kind of hard to imagine that Yitzchak and the Midrashim talk about this. Like Yitzchak really did know what Esav was and who Esav was, and he loved him anyway. You know, and you could actually tie that in to the idea of right, the Arba Banim at the Haggadah, that even the Russia, however we define the Russia, still has a place at the table, right? There's never that sense of we're completely giving up on any personality any, and that every child is somebody's child. Every adult even is somebody's child. So, you know, and I think, and I think in a way it's ironic to see that Yitzhak, who is so godly, that it's like, it's almost like God's love that we're seeing. It's like he holds out hope for Asa until, literally until the last moment and possibly till it's too late. So, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, yes? I just want to um, tie it into what happened this past week with this, you know, lunatic killing people. That that sometimes love isn't appropriate, or maybe not. I, maybe there is a certain when it's just too late. They didn't report him enough, or they right. didn't 
he was really bad, Esau. I think you're missing that. Esau was really bad. If you read all the Midrashim about him, he was a murderer. He was an adulterer. He was a ganav. He was a hunter. He was a bad person. No, and that yet, is in the shot. Right. So that that's the only thing I would say is like whenever we read these Midrashim and. And again, I just go back to Menachem Lipeg, which is, you know, take Midrash seriously, in that the Midrashim were written at a certain time and at a certain place, and, and it's pretty clear that the Midrash had an agenda. There's no doubt in my mind that Asa was an unsavory character, if for no other reason than the fact that he made his living as a hunter. He didn't hunt for survival, he hunted because that was his profession, you know. So that in itself is very, very telling. I'm not, I'm ambivalent about, how, about come, and, and you know, I've been studying this for years and years, I'm still ambivalent and undecided as to at what point the, the Tanaim, who are writing these Midrashim at a time when you really have to make the line between us and them, really clear, whether it's Jews and Hellenists or Jews and Romans slash Christians, mm -hmm. whether their descriptions of the insider who is the insidious enemy is as much cautionary tale as accurate. Isn't Asaph supposed to be Christianity? And, yeah. So according to the later Mepharshim, Asaph is Christianity, and he really is. In other words, he's your twin, right? He grew up alongside of you, and he, for hundreds of years, looks like you, right? The early Christians were Jews. They thought of themselves as Jews. The Romans thought of them as Jews. Jews thought of them as heretical Jews, but still Jews. It wasn't until probably the third century, right, the 200s, you know, Paul was around 100, and he was very much still, Paul, who was Saul, was a Tana. He was a Tana. Okay, let's, let's process this. That's like saying, you know, somebody of the level of Rav Moshe Feinstein, Zichrona Lebracha, the Rav, Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky. That person became Paul, Saint Paul. Like, that was a, a huge mental shock to us. I mean, it was terrifying. Like, if Rav, Rav Moshe Feinstein could become a patron saint of the new Judaism, like, yeah, I, like, we, it's, it's hard for us to fathom. So I think what happened in those over that time, and I mean, it started with the Greeks, is there really became a very survivalistic and desperate need to warn people that even the one that looks like your brother or your cousin or whatever, you got to be careful. And things that look simple aren't. Like a simple hunter isn't just a simple hunter. Oh, he's not just, you know, some guy that goes out and hunts. This is a fundamental flaw. But I'm not 100% sure that that was actually the Asaph who lived in these pages or that was something that was needed at that point to really drive home to us the danger next door. So, and it, it's a very valid disagreement, right? And this disagreement goes between, you know, if you look at, at Rashi, for example, Rashi completely says what you're saying. Like he, you know, brings down all of these nutrition. He sees Asa as evil, like categorically evil. The Ramban and the Malbim are more nuanced in their, their view. Rav Hirsch kind of straddles in between. So it's kind of, it really depends on who, who you're looking at and how much, and I think it's also not coincidental that Rashi is writing in Catholic France, right, at the eve of the Crusades, and the Ramban is writing in Spain when it's still pretty fundamentally under the Moors. So it's like they're writing from their own zeitgeist, right? And Rav Hirsch is writing from, from Enlightenment Germany and the Malbim is writing from Poland at a time when a little education actually could have been a good thing for the Jews and there was strong resistance against it. So like I'm a really a firm believer, you know, if we believe Elu Be'elu Divrei Kim Chaim, that you have to also take into context what, what the perspective is. Like Abba Sha'ol, and I didn't know this until I went to Kesaria a number of years ago, the Tana 
Abba Shaul lived in Caesarea, and he was the peacemaker between the Romans, the Christians, and the Jews. That was his job. He was the chief rabbi of the community, so to speak. But in this job as chief rabbi, his, and, and you could see this in his, in his comments, that his, I think it was he who said, right, um, talked about Aaron as being, oh, shalom, the road, Dev shalom, right, that, that that's his world. If you read Rabbi Akiva's comments, and particularly when he talks about who doesn't get Olam Haba, and one of the things he says in the Sechet Sanhedrin, who doesn't get some Olam Haba, is anybody who reads Sifrei Chitzumim, non-holy texts. You pick up the New York Times, and according to Rabbi Akiva, that's it, you're done. Because again, when was it, right? <laughs> there was my People magazine. <laughs> Um, you know, Great Expectations, Shakespeare, Aristotle, yeah, Rabbi Akiva said, because re let's remember who Rabbi Akiva was. Rabbi Akiva was Alicia Venavoya's buddy. He saw what the result was of starting to learn philosophy and science and not being able to integrate it with Torah values. Okay, and he saw Rome and its beautiful structures and its colosseums and its races and its, its you know, science and its math and its technology and its aqueducts and its viaducts and its whatever ducts, okay? But he's like, hello, let's not judge this book by its cover, literally. And if you start opening that book and reading that book and worshiping that book, what's going to happen? you're going to lose your reverence of God because you're going to be worshipping that 140-story structure. So they're definitely writing from where they're coming from. So, you know, I do think that Asaph was evil, and I do think that Yitzhak missed something, but I think that, that I'm sorry, I don't remember your name. Fern. Fern. What Fern was saying is that I think the reason Yitzhak missed it is because he loved him so much. And that's not, you can't fault a father for loving his child. That's, which is what's so heartbreaking here. You know, and, and look at Asaph's reaction. All right, go, go, go. Um, where are we? I lost my place again. What? Thank you. Hafzai. Perak of Zion, right? But um, so Esau comes back, right? After, and Yitzhak isn't fooled. That, I mean, I'm telling you what I think and what a number of the Mepharshim feel very strongly. Yitzhak is not fooled. Yitzhak gets it. He understands what's going on. He has visions. He sees Olam Haba. He, 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 he's not an idiot. He gets it. And here I think is again his Yitzhakness that he's putting his complete trust in what's happening, right? If this person is coming to him, who clearly is not Asa, and is asking for the bracha, then I've got to follow the plan. And I think it's, again, you know, Yitzhak is that completely, he puts himself into the hands of the plan. If the plan is that he should be shechted, if the plan is that he should marry this woman that he's never seen before in his life, who's completely different than him, fine. If the plan is that he should bless this person who's in front of him, who's clearly not Asa, and I'm not a moron, okay, we can see by his questions, right? Who are you? So he goes by, by the plan, he blesses him, Okay, and then Vayochav Yosheid Vayomer Yitzchak Elav Amin Pasuk Kavzayin. Right, come close to me. Right, come here. <laughs> Still doesn't believe it. Yaakov. Right, Vayigash Yitz Vayigash. He touched him. Vayishaklo, and he kissed him. Does this begin to sound like Lavan? Right, this is the Lavan. What Lavan did is like these are two sides of the same coin. It's like if you're not sure about something, you, you push and push and push until you're sure or until you think you're sure, right? He brings him close, he kisses him, he smells him. The only time we hear of one human being smelling another human being in the entire time. Hmm, ban? Secret? 
Calvin Klein, ooh, Calvin Klein, you know, like, okay, smells like Asa, right? Feels like Asa, smells like Asa, cooks like Asa, but somehow doesn't sound like Asa. Okay, I guess it's gotta be Asa. And then he, he goes through with it, um, gives him the bracha, and Yaakov leaves. Okay, now we're in Pesach Lamedal. The Asa v'achiv ba mitzit. Right, comes back from his hunting and he does what he's supposed to do. And then he goes to his father and he says, Yakom avi vilcha. My father should get up. And again, this is a place where Chazal absolutely jumped in. It's like, you mean my father should get up? Father is old man. Father's clearly not well. Father shouldn't be getting up. Asaph should bring, be bringing father food. And then that's the hakol kol yako. It's the way of, of speaking. Okay, um, and come and, and eat from the hunting of his son, and then then your soul will be able to bless me. And again, notice how many times, bain and ah, bain and ah, and bain and ah, it's mentioned here. And he says, miata, I, I, I can only, as a director, imagine directing that, those two words. Miata. Like what? What was going on in his head, in those two tiny words? Like, talk about your life flashing in front of your eyes, your whole life with your son, and all your feelings about your son, and all your feelings about your father. Who are you? Remember the Cheshire Cat in um, Alice in Wonderland? Who are you? That was supposed to be Samuel Coleridge. It was like a major opium addict. Um, little known facts about Disney that I found out in the last ten years. <laughs> Okay, so who are you? That's an ascent, that's an existential question. Okay, Vayomer ani bincha bichorecha esav. Bincha bichidcha asher ahavta Yitzchak. Right? It, clearly these stories must have been retold by Yitzchak to his children and to Abraham to his grandchildren. The language is just too similar. What, what do you mean? I am, number one, I am I. Number two, I'm your son. Number three, I'm your firstborn son. Let me remind you here. Number four, I am Esau. All of those reasons, right? And then Yitzhak is trembling. And this word by Yecherad is used by Harsina, the mountain shaking. Like this is literally a foundational terror. Imagine again, as a parent, the last thing a parent wants to do is to hurt their child. Even if they don't like their child that much. Even if at one moment you want to take that child and throw the child out the door, over the cliff, like, okay, fine. You don't really want to hurt the child, you just want the child to take a long walk and leave you alone for a while. You know, grow up, become a parent themselves, and then they'll figure it out. But, the, how many stories have we heard from, from the Holocaust of it. mothers <laughs> joining their children in the death marches to knowing they were going to go into the gas chambers? Or what care, or these like adrenaline rushes, right? Where the, the, you pick up a Volkswagen and you pull you. What would a parent not do for their child? And, and he realizes in this instant how the f forever future has been altered. So he's, he's terrified. And he says, right, right, and again we have this, this, it says, you know, like if, if remember how I said important, how important it is when the word me'od is used? Look at all these words. Charada gidola ad me'od. Like, exponentially, to the Google. He's terrified. Vayomer, mi enfo, who, who, therefore, who, who, who's the guy who was, was here? Right? He hunted, he brought me food, and I eat, and, and I gave him a bracha, and, and I told him, Baruch yeah, blah, blah, blah. Vayitzak tse'aka gidola humara adi'ah. Right? And, and there are lots of interesting also about this, about how this, why, why one of the reasons why Esau's head is buried in, in Marat HaMachpilah, and why Christianity comes from the Jews is that, that there is this one moment of pure 
love that is translated into pure grief that Asaf has for his father. And according to some of the opinions, it is the, the, this frustration that by the time we get to Amale, two generations later, has been so concentrated that that's why Amalek is who he is. Right? It's this one feeling of that, that Amalek actually did have reason to hate the Israel. That that he's happening upon them, right? The Ata Ayef the Yageya. Remember those words? Look at what happened, what you did to me when I was tired. Look at what you did to me when I was came back exhausted from the field and brought my father food. That that Amalek's pure hatred of, of B'nai Yisrael is so unmitigated because of what happened. Now because it's so unmitigated is why we've got to get rid of it. Um, you know, and then things devolve from here. And the brothers are, are separated. Yaakov runs for his life. Um, and even once they beat up 20 years later and they, they do make peace, it's, it's more like a truce rather than a real peace. And there's never really peace between Yaakov and Esav, not when Esav was Edom, nor when Yaakov, I'm sorry, when Esav was, we now call Christianity. And, and according to the Ibn Ezra, Klal Gadol, Esav Sonei, and, and he's writing from Moorish Spain, like serious Moorish Spain. And, and he was writing in the 1100s, and he's saying, here's the bottom line. It is now 2,000 years after this event. Esau still hates Yaakov. Esau is always going to hate Yaakov. That is never going to change. Um, which, you know, here I'm going to throw out a little bit of a political question, which is, you know, this, which I, it's not mine. I've seen this read seen this written and I've read it, is like in this, this relationship that, that the Jewish community has with the conservative Christian community, right? Like the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Like it's, it, somebody wrote like in the wake of Rav Soloveitchik's article um, on how to deal with ASAP in the workplace. It's like, be careful. It was like a cautionary article. Like it's really nice that that right now there's this alliance of purpose between these two groups. But you got to remember it's still ASAP and there's going to come a point where there's going to be a, a point of no return and, and you can't ignore that. It wasn't a critical, the article wasn't critical. The article was meant to just be careful. Like just don't forget. Don't forget where, where, this, where this is coming from. Like don't assume that just because they have conservative values and we have conservative values that we should be buddies and, you know, let bygones be bygones. Yeah, but Krasansky wrote on his blog this week about the Pope's visit to Israel and talks all about that. Right, right. But this was actually already, I don't even remember, I think this was actually around the time, believe it or not, that I think it was that Nefesh Benefesh was started because Nefesh Benefesh was started with a lot of money from the Christian awesome. conservatives. And I think, it, again, it's like, the article said, I am not criticizing Nefesh Benefesh for taking, that was like the first line, like, don't get me wrong, but just keep this tucked away in the back of your mind, right? And it's like really nice that we have the most philo, what is it? Philo-Semitic Pope we have ever had. Good Jesuit, good Maimonides, um, but he's still the Catholic Pope. <laughs> Gotta love those Jesuits. Which I really do. Best mm -hmm. education I got. Um, Jesuits. They're, they are the YU of the Catholic world. Anyway, okay, so let's let's just very quickly move over to Yaakov and his family. Um, we know we know the story. Yaakov marries, wants to marry for love, um, and gets tricked into. How old was he? He was sixty-five. Sixty-five. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, these were not young right. swains. Okay? But the women were much younger. Un also oh, unclear. We, that's my students always say to me, how old were Rafael and Leah? And I said, I don't know. It's very interesting. They're, we really, even the Midrash has like, you know, it's unclear how old they were. Whether they were like Rifka much younger or whether they had literally been waiting around for Yaakov and Asa to show up and, and claim them, basically. They were like 
these two cousins were promised to the two cousins and were sitting there and waiting for them, which actually, by the way, puts into context why Lavan did what he did with Leia, right? My two daughters have been sitting around, they've been waiting for their first cousins to show up. This is what's supposed to happen. This first cousin shows up, tells me the story why the other cousin hasn't showed up, really clear that the other cousin isn't going to show up, and if that other cousin shows up, this cousin is going to hightail it out of town really fast. I better marry off both of my sisters to this cousin. Makes a lot of sense what he did. Right? It's it's really long, long logical. Attention all ninth graders, please make your way to the MPR for Mechanachet. All tenth and eleventh graders, we're heading out to Boti, please meet us in the lobby. Thank you. Okay, um, so they get so Yaakov marries thinks he met. Tenth graders, please come to the atrium. We are going to walk to Moti and have our picnic. Yay! Okay. 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 Um, so, so Yaakov marries who he thinks is Rachel. She's not. He's not very happy about it. That's really clear, regardless of how you interpret the word. You know that Leia was snua. There's a machloket, the Swarno believes that the word snua means less loved, and the other mafarshim are like, no, we're going to take this on its face and we say that it means hated. The reason the Sforno says what he does, he's not just being kind, is that in Devarim, when it says a man marries two women, one is ahuva and one is snua, so the Sforno says clearly she was ahuva when he married her, because otherwise if she was snua, he wouldn't have married her willingly. So clearly, they, she was Ahuva, but now in comparison to the other one, she is Snua. So this woman is, so Leia is the Snua, whatever that means. Rachel is the Ahuva. Leia has the children. Rachel has the love. Nobody's happy. So massive triangulation starts happen, right? Reuven comes along, little boy, and says, sees mommy is not happy, brings mommy these flowers. By the way, it, it, you know, pretty likely that Ruve knew what these flowers were for because that was something that people knew. These flowers were somehow fertility drugs. Okay, like we know that M&Ms are really good tasting little chocolate candy. So if you bring your mom a handful of M&Ms to make her feel better, you know exactly what you're doing. You're bringing her chocolate because it tastes good. Bring her these flowers, which, by the way, are very rare and really hard to find. It's like a four-leaf clover. He's not bringing them to her because they're dandelions growing in the front yard. Okay? These, he makes a real effort. He finds them. So, so, and then the conversation that ensues in Paraglamid is, like, amazing. So, Rachel comes to Leia, and she says, give me some of these dudai. And Leia says back to Rachel, enough that you stole my husband from me. Now you want to steal my Dudaim too? Tammy Noskow to PC9, please come to the office. Tammy Noskow to PC9, please come to the office. Tammy Noskow to PC9. Thank you. So, which begs its own question, Rachel didn't steal Yaakov from Leia. If anything, Leia stole Yaakov from Rachel, but that's, you know, it's really clear how Rachel feels. So then Rachel comes along, and again, that Bini, right? My son, ah, my kid, nanny, 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 I have a kid and you don't. And then Rachel's like, okay, okay, I'll make you a deal. I'll give you my night with my husband. You give me your Dudai. Wow. Okay. And out of... Ninth grade to the NPR, Tammy Nasca to PC9 to the office. And then the child who comes out of this is Yisachar, who's like, pretty much Yisachar and Zavulun are like the voiceless ones in, this whole, in the whole story, right? Ruben, Shimon, Levi, Yehuda, we know about them, we hear about them, right? God, Asher, Dan, Naftali are the B'nai Hashvachot. Yosef and Binyamin are Rachel's children. And somewhere Yusachar and Zavula just kind of get lost in this. So the child and the two children that come out of this whole tarantara with the Dudaim are basically, we never hear from them, ever. Like, not a word. They're quiet. And there's even a big machloket between the Ramban and Rashi, like, whose side were they on anyway? 
Anyway, so, and then we know what happened. Jerome, can you come to the main office, please? Jerome, can you come to the main office, please? The children side with their mothers, which makes perfect sense, because that's what children are going to do. All juniors, come to the lobby. We're going to vote Tea Park. All juniors, come to the lobby now. Woo! <laughs> I love it here. Um, because this is, you know, and, and this is actually, this is also something new, though. Let me take it for granted. But what we had with Abraham, right, you don't see Yitzchak or Yishmael aligning with a parent at all. Nor do you see them align with each other. They're at cross purposes. With Yaakov and Rivka, you see one child align with each parent, and they're at cross purposes to each other. Rabbi Bla, please come to the office. Rabbi Bla, please come to the office. With Yaakov and his children, he's off to the side. Yaakov doesn't really have a role here, except when it comes to Yosef. But up until the point that Yosef is born, right, it's the boys and their mothers. And even to some degree after Yosef is born, right, Yosef hangs out with, the, with Echav, and then it says, you know, and he was with Bilhah's and Zilpah's kids. Also big mahlokan about what that means. Rabbi Blau, Rabbi Blau, please come to the office. I can't imagine how this sounds on that. Um, but, <laughs> So, but really, you know, so there's this whole new dynamic where children align with mothers, father is off stage, father comes back on stage to disastrous results, and then goes back off stage. And like, by the time you get to Parshat Vayeshev, Yaakov is like marginalized, and it becomes the focus, and, and this is really the first time that we have a story about siblings. It's not so much a story about parents and children. And, and I think that this evolution is very important because what it means is, is that, that we are no longer just us and our parents. We are us and our peers. It's like that first time that there's a peer group. And that's, you know, that's why they're the Shiftei Yisrael. Why, did the Shvat, why didn't we just start with Yaakov? You know, what? Because you need a peer group. And the peer group has its own dynamic and its own problems. The peer group seems blessedly to resolve its problems after a while, which is, is interesting. And, and that's why I think that this is the end of the Sefer, as, as tragic as it is, is incredibly hopeful. Right? You have Yosef, who they wanted to murder. I'm not making this up. It's in the text, right? Let's kill him. Instead, they sell him into slavery. Not quite sure which is worse, okay? They sell him into slavery. As far as they're concerned, he's dead, he's gone. He was tortured, he was imprisoned for, you know, 10 years. Now he's Prince of Egypt. Okay. Yeah, you're able to be right now, so start walking and we'll meet all you there. Yay. See you soon. Right? So, if you're Yosef and the brothers show up, I think you know, taking him for a little emotional ride was probably the least he could do to them. Not that it wasn't problematic, but, you know, he didn't have them killed. He wanted to teach them a lesson. Once he saw they learned a lesson, he was done. There's no, not only was there no recrimination, but the Sefer ends, Sefer Barashi ends, with Yosef lying for the sake of Shalom Bayer. And he said, I promised my father I would not take revenge on him. He never did any such thing. He said it because he knew it would make them feel better. And Rashi there in the Midrash and the Gemara says on the spot, sometimes it's okay to lie for Shalom Bayit. And we learn this here. And I think that, you know, a Sefer that begins with one brother killing another brother, right? And that, that the end of the Sefer, it, it ends with the brothers saying that even under these really awkward, if not awful, circumstances, we can come together as, as a community. And that's like, that's really hopeful in terms of community dynamics and even family dynamics. That this power of, you know, tshuva and forgiveness and that, that it really carries a lot. Mm -hmm.
But it even ends with Ephraim and Menasha and them being treated unequally, but still and being finding okay a way to work it out and not exactly. having a huge problem. That's exactly. what it really ends in, right. I think. Yeah, yeah. Right. Right. And, you know, Mashiach and Yosef and Mashiach and David. And, and, like, you know, Alex Israel wrote a wonderful article about that. And, you know, that's, that's the end. Like, there is hope at the end. The end of the Sefer is actually kind of a happy ending, which doesn't happen too often in Tanakh. And, you know, it, it, gives, it gives us hope in terms of community future, but also within a family, that you don't give up. And sometimes it can take 20 years to resolve a family problem. But if you kind of predicate it on a sense of compassion and love and forgiveness and mutual working it out, it can work. The end. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah.